Hi, this is Mr. Campbell, and this is for my Social Studies 8 classes, Unit 2, Section 1. And today we're going to talk about the age of exploration uh, in the beginning phases. So let's just go ahead and dive right into it. Uh, first of all, our first visitors from Europe, you all have probably heard, and if you haven't, you've heard it now, the saying uh, that Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Uh, the question that we often... Um, don't ask because we just accept this as fact was was he first was he the first to discover the continent and and the short answer is no uh he was not at least he likely was not um he he is given historical credit for it in many in many instances that is not entirely accurate um but such is the case with a lot of uh, sort of historical accepted norms. Um, so we are going to sort of do a little bit to dispel that, but we are also going to spend quite a bit of time today talking about Columbus's um, Columbus's exploits as well. So archaeological evidence suggests that the first uh, European explorers to uh, find the American continent um, were the Vikings. Um, that we believe that around the year 1000, 1001, that Leif Erikson led a group of about 35 sailors, and they would have sailed from what is now modern Greenland to what is now modern Virginia. And that is actually somewhat of a legitimate distance. You think about Europe to, um, you know, the American, the North American continent, especially that's a pretty decent distance, but when you think about it in terms of Greenland, which is in the North Atlantic Sea, it is much closer to the North American continent than the European seaboard is, so this is not completely unfounded, and it is supported by some archaeological evidence. Um, they spend a winter in an area that they called Vinland. Um, this area is what, again, is now modern Virginia, and it really only exists in myth for about the next 500 years or so. Now, this is where we pick up the story of Christopher Columbus, and we, we, we pick it up here, and this may be a bit clunky in terms of our timeline, but we pick it up because he, he may or he may not have heard of this mythical Vinland. This might have been his motivation for believing that if we sail west, we're not going to fall off the side of the earth into the abyss of space and time, uh, but instead we're going to find a, 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 a land, some land that we're not entirely sure of, that, but that has never been explored before, or at the very least, we may find China, and that's what he's looking for. He's looking for a faster route to China. Now, Columbus is Italian. He leaves his hometown, though, and he, he sets up... Um, in Portugal in the 1470s. And the reason that he would choose Portugal is because Portugal is one of the leading seafaring nations of the world at that point of the known world. Remember, China is probably much more advanced than European nations at this point in history. Um, so we are taking a very Eurocentric, um, a, a very Eurocentric view of world history at this point. Um, but that's what Columbus knows. And so that's where he's going to settle. He puts out a plan um, to the king of Portugal. Hey, we're going to sail west. We're going to find this quicker route to China. And the king of Portugal says, mm, no, that, that, that's not going to fly. He, he just sort of dismisses Columbus out of hand. Um, this seems absolutely crazy to him. Again, the Portuguese are the leading European seafaring nation, which is no surprise because they border Spain to the east and the ocean to the west. And that's pretty much it. So... The Portuguese king decides that this really is not worth wasting any time or any resources on. Um, we're pretty happy with the way things are right now. So Columbus, undeterred, he takes his plan to King Ferdinand and Queen, that is to say, Isabella of Spain. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain. And King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella actually listen to his plan, and they pretty much look at it as... This is a pretty low-risk, high-reward prop proposition. Look, if we give this guy a few men, a couple of ships, and he sails west, the worst thing that happens is he sails off the face of the known world, dies, and is never heard from again. We don't really lose anything other than a few men and a couple of ships. The best thing that could happen is he actually does find a new route to China, and... 
we get credit for it. So this is really kind of a win-win for us. So they decide, um, after about six years, they decide to give him about three ships um, and support his voyage. So when Columbus set sail in August of 1492, he's given about 90 men, three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Now, these ships are incredibly, incredibly small. For a little bit of comparison's sake, they were about 55 to 90 feet long. That's about as long as ships got during this time period. A modern aircraft carrier, which is considered a floating city, is about a 1,000 feet long at minimum. So these ships are absolutely tiny. Um, Columbus says we're going to get there in 21 days. Now, 21 days on a small ship is a long time. It's about three weeks. After a month which is about four weeks, the crew begins to become mutinous. Now, when we say mutinous, we mean that they're ready to tie Columbus up, throw him overboard, take control of the ship, turn around and go home, and leave Columbus to die. That's a bad way if you're Columbus. However, he is saved on October 21st when a sailor does spot land. Now, Columbus, naturally very, very excited. He does have to actually come ashore, though, and legally claim the land for Spain. European powers during this time period are very, very concerned with legalities. They want things to be set up the right way, legally speaking. Uh, so Columbus and a representative of the Spanish government actually has to come ashore before anybody else can read an official royal pro proclamation that, that claims this land in the name of Spain. There's nobody there to listen to it. Even if they were there, they wouldn't understand any of it. Uh, but that's what they feel like they have to do to make sure that this is legal. He calls the land the West Indies because that's where he thought he was. He thought he was somewhere in the neighborhood of India. Um, he knew that he had maybe gotten blown off course a little bit, so maybe he had missed China. But he thought for sure he was in India, and so he calls the land the West Indies. He actually later writes in his journal that it is his intent to go to the island of Japan, which again sounds very, very strange geographically, because we're nowhere near China, India, or Japan. But again, that's where Columbus thought that he was. In all actuality, he la he has landed on what is now the island of Cuba, which is about 90 miles off the coast of Florida. Now, he, hit, he heads back to Spain, and when he heads back to Spain, he reports back to the king and queen that there are large amounts of gold in this new territory. Now, a little bit of a spoiler, he doesn't actually know that. He's been told that by secondhand accounts, but he's kind of just making things up as he goes at this point. Now, naturally, King Ferdinand, Queen Isabel, they're very, very pleased about this. They feel like they've discovered new lands for trade, let alone the fact that there's a lot of gold in these places. So they're very, very eager to back more voyages. They make him governor of all the land that he claims, and they send him back in 1493. Instead of three ships and about a 1,000 men, or excuse me, about 90 men, he gets sent back with an armada, which is essentially a fleet, 17 ships, 1,500 soldiers, settlers, and priests. Those priests are going to become very, very important because one of his goals, in addition to finding this gold that he had promised that there was, it's also his goal to convert the Indians, again, that may be looked at as a derogatory term, but to Columbus, this is an accurate term because he believes he's in India, so the people from India would be called Indians. He wants to convert the Indians to Christianity, hence the need for the priests. We are going to track the, the progress of sort of the advancement of Christianity in this area quite a bit throughout this and other lectures. He makes a third trip in 1498, and he actually believes that he, he finds the Asian mainland. He actually dies thinking that he had found China. It's actually South America. Now, some may find this to be uh, somewhat fitting that he dies thinking that he had found China when really he was halfway around the world. I actually, I actually kind of find it sad. I mean, the guy, the guy thought that he had just found China and that was it. Uh, when in fact he had made a, a far more uh, impactful discovery um, than that. So he actually dies thinking that he had set foot on China. Now. Um, Columbus trades a few things with the natives that he encounters. Yes, he does actually take a couple natives with him back to Spain. Again, Columbus, as it's been pointed out in class a couple times, has kind of a sketchy reputation. Um, and this is to our 
modern eyes. Columbus, even the king and queen of Spain, they would not have thought, they wouldn't have thought twice about this. This would have been just old hat for them. Um, but yes, he does take a couple of natives back with him. Now, the goods are very important that they trade, but equally important are the diseases, the customs that they exchange as well, and this is known as the Columbian Exchange. Now, historically, as it's been well established, the Native Americans get definitely the short end of the stick. They are riddled with diseases that, as John Green points out in one of his videos, it's not really a decimation because that implies that one in ten are killed. This is more of, I think he uses the term, an octosimization, where it's more like eight in ten, uh, but you get the point. They also receive guns, which in the short term seems like kind of a good thing because it's, it's a more technologically advanced weapon. It actually turns out to be a mixed blessing because a lot of these native tribes are warring tribes, meaning they're fighting with each other. So in getting these guns, yes, they're getting a more technologically advanced weapon, but it's a weapon that they can use to kill more of themselves faster, um, which further helps with the optimization of the native population. Uh, ultimately, they, they lose their lands to the European colonizers. We know this looking forward into history. At the time, there's no way that we would have known this was going to be the end result, but it definitely does happen. So yes, the natives get by far and away the short end of the stick. Um, so that ends up uh, section one. Uh, section two, which you will be assigned at a later date, is going to be Spain's empire in the Americas. We will transition now from Columbus to some of the early Spanish explorers and some of the impact that they have. Um, so you need to make sure and have these fill-in notes uh, completed. Um, I will collect those on Monday before we begin our discussion uh, for the day. Uh, good luck. I don't think this will be a big deal. I think this is going to be something that's going to be very, very productive. Um, so that sums up uh, Unit 2, Section 1. Uh, we'll see you guys later.